Hi, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of A Book Nerd and the Bible. My name is Sam, and I am so excited to be working on a project that has been on my mind for a very, very long time. For clarity up front, I do want to say that I am a Christian, and I have grown up, probably like many of you, reading the Bible and the wonderful and truthfully sometimes very crazy stories that it contains. But I also grew up really reading any book that I could get my hands on, and I grew to love literature of all kinds at a really young age as well. And as I got older, I enjoyed more and more to see the biblical allusions found in some of my favorite books. Sometimes this was on purpose. We can probably all think of a few stories where the author is absolutely trying to connect the dots between what they are writing and a biblical meaning or story that they want to discuss. But other times, it was really just a testament to the influence the Bible's had on our cultural storytelling. It is hard to write a story without someone trying to fit that into a narrative or arc that we see in the Bible. So this podcast is really an attempt to start a discussion about the similarities between some of my favorite stories and the Bible. My hope is that this will draw in Christians like myself who really love to find new and interesting ways to interpret the Bible. I think literature is a great place to start because it can really help you conceptualize things that can be hard to think about or hard to discuss if you're just reading the Bible straight through. But I also want to say if you are not a Christian and you are just curious about the role the Bible has played in influencing some of our most well-known stories, I will be discussing that as well and trying to bring up a little history that goes beyond simply what the Bible is saying up front to give us a little bit of idea about why the author might be writing this and, and why we're discussing it this way. I just want to be clear, I don't have a degree in literature or biblical studies, but I hope that starting this conversation will help others to see it's okay to find meaning in stories, even if you just love to read. You don't need a PhD in literature to draw your own conclusions and meanings from what you read, and that is absolutely some of the best part of reading your favorite stories. Now, for the entire first season of this podcast, I want to dedicate it to the origins of some of my favorite characters. Um, for me, this means I want to look at how these characters' early lives mirror our stories of Jesus before he starts his ministry and really has the spotlight of his travels and ministry put on him. And so I want to know what we can learn from these types of origin stories. For my first episode, I'm actually going to be diving into one of my all-time favorite characters in literature. Truthfully, this series is one of the most influential in my life. I've read through the series multiple times, and each time I still find obviously fun, um, but new meaning and new lessons on how to live my life in them every time. So for my first episode, I am going to be looking at the very beginning of the Harry Potter series. Let's take a look at chapter one, The Boy Who Lived from Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and how it compares to the nativity stories, as well as a couple of lessons that we can kind of pull from both of them. I am planning on making this a three-part series, and so today we are going to be going over some background for both the stories and then looking at two classic villains. Yes, that's right. So for part one of this three-part series, we will be comparing Herod the Great and Lord Voldemort. So let's dive in. Harry Potter is an instantly recognizable name for anyone who was alive in America during the 2000s. Not only was the book series one of the most popular of all time, but a movie series following the stories would bring millions of moviegoers, often wearing wizard robes I might add, to theaters across the country. But I still think it is important to give a quick summation of the chapter I am discussing today. Chapter 1, The Boy Who Lives, from Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, begins with a description of an ordinary family named the Dursleys, who live in an ordinary house on Privet Drive in Surrey, England. Mr. Dursley, the father of a young boy, and a man who seems to love normality in a nearly religious fashion, goes to work and encounters a series of strange observations throughout the day. After overhearing a strange-looking person talk about a boy named Harry Potter, he confronts his wife, who we learn has an estranged sister of the same last name that the Dursleys seem to be afraid of. Mr. Dursley wonders whether Mrs. Dursley has heard from her sister and asks about her young son, who also happens to be named Harry. Shortly after Mr. Dursley goes to bed, a wizard named Dumbledore arrives in Privet Drive and meets a witch named McGonagall 
who's been waiting for him disguised as a cat. We learn Harry's parents have been murdered by a dark wizard, but Harry has somehow, someway, survived. The downfall of the wizard is a celebration across the country, but Dumbledore and McGonagall have met to decide Harry's future. Dumbledore plans to leave Harry with his aunt and uncle, the Dursleys. Eventually, a giant of a man named Hagrid arrives on a flying motorcycle carrying the baby Harry to meet the other two. Harry is then placed on the doorstep of the Dursleys, and the small group departs, wishing Harry luck with his newly adopted family. Thus ends the first chapter of the book. Before we launch into the comparisons between the two, I want to also briefly discuss Jesus' birth. Jesus' birth is described in only two of the four gospel stories of his life, Matthew and Luke. I'll be looking at Matthew's telling of the story for reasons I'm going to be discussing a little bit later. Most biblical scholars seem to read the New Revised Standard Version, so I'll be taking the story from that translation. Now, that being said, we are introduced to Jesus' mother Mary in Matthew chapter 1. The Gospel simply states Mary becomes pregnant with Jesus, and her fiancé Joseph is told the child comes from God in a dream, and to go ahead with their marriage. After Jesus is born, wise men come from the east and begin to ask where the child who has been born the king of the Jews is being kept. The Roman anointed King Herod becomes frightened at this and questioned his advisors to learn where the Jewish prophecies foretold the king would be born. The advisors told him Bethlehem, so the king blesses the wise men to travel and find the baby and return to tell him the location so that he might worship the child as well. Of course, most of us know the wise men arrive with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they are warned in a dream not to return to Herod. Meanwhile, Joseph is told to take his wife and her newborn child to Egypt and remain there until an angel gives him the okay to return. This piece of advice would potentially save Jesus' life because Herod sends soldiers to kill all the children under two years of age in Bethlehem when the wise men don't return to tell him where the baby is. Herod later dies, but Joseph does not feel confident to return to Bethlehem, but instead heads to a somewhat remote area called Galilee. This essentially concludes the Gospel of Matthew's telling of the Nativity story. Now, I wanted to point out a few historical tidbits really quickly. There are many Herods in Jewish history, and the one we are discussing today is Herod the Great, because Jesus' birth year matches up with the end of his reign. Historians are unsure of whether Herod the Great actually ordered the massacre of infant children in Bethlehem. Some point to the fact that this recording in Matthew is the only mention of the massacre found in historical records. This omission seems conspicuous, and to some it might be a convenient way to fit some Jewish prophecies into Jesus' life. Others point to the fact that this would have occurred later in Herod's life when his mental and physical health were rapidly deteriorating. During this time, it is recorded Herod could become quickly violent and even had his own family members murdered, including his son and heir only five days before his own death. Between Herod's violent mood swings and the small population of Bethlehem, it is entirely possible he could have ordered the infants of this town to be killed without much notice. If you want more info about Herod, I recommend checking out biblicalarchaeology.org and a great story called Finding King Herod's Tomb from Smithsonian Magazine. Another quick thing to mention, Matthew's gospel is being written for a Jewish Christian audience. This means that the writer of Matthew likely had an interest in making Herod out to be a villain because of his lineage and connection to Rome. There is no doubt he could be a savvy and violent political operative, but Herod was also an epic builder who transformed many parts of Israel during his reign. For more info on this, check out the references I mentioned above. Okay, so I think this is enough information to start with. So let's dive into some comparisons between Lord Voldemort and King Herod. Okay, let's get started. My first discussion piece for the comparison of Herod and Voldemort is their reaction to a prophecy foretelling the rise of someone who might rival them. I want to add that I'm going to be looking at details we learn later in the Harry Potter series to draw some of these comparisons. If you haven't read any of the Harry Potter books and you want to be safe from spoilers, I recommend stopping here. Now, to start with Voldemort, we learn later in the series that Voldemort is told a prophecy that an individual born at the end of July will have the power to vanquish the Dark Lord. It reads like this, The one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord approaches, born to those who have thrice defied him born as the seventh month dies. Voldemort identifies Harry as the individual the prophecy speaks of bringing his doom, and he decides to take matters into his own hands by murdering Harry and his family in the process. 
Voldemort is a man who has risen from being a lonely orphan to the terror of an entire country. He's amassing followers and believes he will soon control all of England. So he, of course, is seeking to weed out any challengers to his power. Turning our attention to Herod, we see Herod informed by wise men of the East that a child who is the king of the Jews has been born. Herod is a client king of Rome, which means Herod has some independence as long as he pays tribute to Rome and adheres to instructions on some high-level matters. Like Voldemort, he is a self-made man who has risen to unfathomable heights on the back of his own political skill and brutality. He simply has to protect Roman interests, and he will be permitted to rule and profit from Israel. Now, like Voldemort, he is told that a potential rival has been born. So, Herod reacts, again, like Voldemort, and attempts to use violence as a solution to this problem. Their reaction to the prophecies of coming rivals reveals the insecurity the two self-made men have about their own futures. Both Matthew and J.K. Rowling use the predictions of the future to suggest an inevitability to the downfalls we are witnessing at the beginning of the stories. The authors seem to be suggesting that Voldemort and Herod are fighting some system of fate. Of course, this is more understandable for Voldemort, who is told he cannot live while his rival survives, but it is still entirely reasonable to deal with the problem in other ways than murdering entire families. Both men also must rely on others to relay the prophecies to them. Snape to Voldemort and Jewish advisors to Herod. This further suggests that both villains are out of touch with the religious or mystic parts of their society. In other words, they may suffer from a lack of respect for tradition or ritual because of their backgrounds as self-made men. One main difference I would like to point out is the circumstances of when these two men receive information about their potential rivals. Voldemort is rapidly rising to power, and I think we can attribute the societal upheaval in the wizarding world to his own destructive means. Herod, however, is a man attempting to retain control in a rapidly shifting world. L. Michael White, a classics professor at the University of Texas, states Herod faced numerous difficulties in placating Rome and quashing political unrest throughout Israel in a PBS article called Jews and the Roman Empire. I recommend checking that out if you want to learn a little bit more background on how that is playing out. But suffice it to say, Herod may see news of a child being born the king of the Jews as a piece of religious fanaticism that needs to be stopped before it snowballs. Herod is attempting to keep some independence for Jews in the region, again discussed in the article above, and fears a Roman military takeover. This actually happens after Jesus' death, so his fears don't really seem all that misplaced. I think this background softens Herod's image some, well, as much as you can for someone with no problems killing innocent children. All that to say, I do think it is important to note that Voldemort's reaction to the prophecy is almost entirely a result of his own actions. The same probably can't be said for Herod. I think this is a perfect segue into the next similarity I find between the two characters. Voldemort and Herod lack the true institutional control they desire. We've discussed Herod's lack of institutional control in the previous section. While he is certainly shrewd and somewhat powerful, it doesn't take a genius to see that Rome is really calling the shots. Herod is only as powerful as they will allow. Meanwhile, Voldemort is unable to truly gain control of the Ministry of Magic in the First Wizarding War. A snippet from J.K. Rowling's Pottermore, which highlights additional details about the Wizarding World, states Harold Mincham, Minister of Magic at the time, was, quote, unable to contain what looked like Voldemort's unstoppable rise to power, end quote. I have no doubt that Voldemort's supporters infiltrated some positions within the Ministry of Magic, but the use of the word contain sounds like Voldemort does not have a puppet on the throne. So both of our villains are extremely powerful men lacking true institutional control at the highest level. What does this mean for our two villains? They cannot reasonably rely on legitimate means to thwart threats of power. Herod cannot use Jewish courts to uphold his political power if those cor courts see another as fulfilling Jewish prophecies of a messiah. He can physically threaten them, but how will that help diminish his image as a power grabber? Similarly, Voldemort's complete reliance on fear and physical violence pigeonholes him into using those same means to tackle any threats. While the two characters are completely in control of their behavior up to that point, it's difficult to imagine a scenario for either that ends without the violence displayed in these stories. I think these two represent the dangers of winning at all cost. Most Americans seem to idealize a self-made rep. I don't think anyone is ever truly self-made, but I can't deny it is an ideal in American culture. I think Herod and Voldemort represent a type of greed and power run awry in subtle ways. 
When you rely on tactics that are outside legal or accepted means, you have to continue to rely on those tactics. Once you cross the line, it can be really difficult to go back. That being said, I do think our two authors are influencing how we view these characters. As mentioned before, the author of Matthew likely had reason to paint Herod in a bad light. Another author might view Herod's use of violence as understandable because Israel lacks autonomy to make its own decisions. He doesn't have the institutional control to call his own shots, and he is using whatever he can to keep some type of freedom for the Jewish people in Israel and prevent a Roman military takeover. It's a little bit harder to make the case for Voldemort, but I do think we have a few historical examples of how perception could change the harshness with which we view him. John D. Rockefeller is a figure that comes to my mind. A somewhat self-made man of enormous business and political acumen, Rockefeller often used dirty tactics to build his standard oil monopoly. Today, some Americans look at him as inspiration for what one can achieve, and others see a horrible man bent on retaining power at all cost. Perhaps the most relevant quote about him comes from Ida Tarbell in her famous The History of the Standard Oil Company. She says, I never had an animus against Standard Oil's size and wealth, never objected to their corporate form. I was willing that they should combine and grow as big and wealthy as they could, but only by legitimate means. But they had never played fair, and that ruined their greatness for me. A lack of institutional control can drive you to do dark things if you are bent on pure power and lack nonviolent ways to resolve conflicts. Perhaps Ida's quote is the equivalent of Wanmaker Ollivander's future reflection about Voldemort. After all, he who must not be named did great things. Terrible, yes, but great. My final comparison is a look at how our villains are thwarted in the stories we have considered today. Ultimately, both Voldemort and Herod's plans to kill the young protagonist of our stories are prevented by sacrifices made by loving parents. Lily Potter's sacrifice is well documented and spoken of often in the series, so it's very easy to discern that her decision to sacrifice herself for Harry's safety provided him with some sort of protection. Voldemort, not realizing how powerful a love and sacrifice of that level can be, brings about his own ruin through his heartless murder of Lily. The sacrifice for Jesus is something that I think is often overlooked in the Nativity story. Joseph is warned in a dream to escape to Egypt, and we often take for granted how hard it might be to listen to this warning. Joseph and Mary lived in a world in which having trust in family and neighbors was often important for survival. And yet the two young parents obediently head to a part of the world that, to our knowledge, they are not familiar with. They likely left behind possessions, family, perhaps even a home they had made, all to protect baby Jesus. In the end, this immense sacrifice keeps him alive. Herod's massacre of the infants is, of course, still sad, but he doesn't reach his ultimate target. I think both of these villains are also a great foil for these sacrifices. As mentioned earlier, Herod would murder up to eight of his family members during political squabbles. He even kills his own son because his son callously expresses delight in inheriting part of Herod's kingdom after his father's impending death. Not exactly an ideal family dynamic. Likewise, Voldemort murders his own father and grandparents in a mix of revenge and hatred. The fact that both men would overlook how hard a mother and father would fight for their child is perhaps a testament to their upbringing in ugly familial relationships. It is therefore somewhat fitting that their plans to erase threats should be vanquished by loving parents. To make the point just a little bit further, both of these children are also protected by guardians that are deeper than the surface level. For Harry, we know Dumbledore has been involved in the planning of how to keep him safe after learning about Voldemort's interpretation of the prophecy. For Jesus, Joseph and Mary are guided by dreams and angels sent from God and believe God is the father of Jesus. Harry and Jesus are recipients of love from higher powers, and this might have brought the eventual downfall of Herod and Voldemort. God directs Mary and Joseph to safety, and his instructions keep the future Messiah alive in a dangerous time of transition. Dumbledore's initial plan to keep Harry safe by making a Fidelia's charm meant to hide the location of the Potter's house fails. However, his attempts to give the Potters a false sense of security that leaves them defenseless when the Dark Lord arrives. In a twist of fate, this defenseless state allows Lily Potter to make the sacrifice that saves Harry's life. Who knows how it would have turned out if the Potters had an opportunity to fight? Would Lily's sacrifice still work? The main difference here is that Lily's sacrifice is the result of Dumbledore's failure to protect the family. Everyone but Harry dies. 
Joseph and Mary are receiving instructions from a God that Christians perceive as omnipotent. So God already knew how and when Herod would act in ways. I think this reveals the thinking of the authors. Christians saw the nativity story as an example of how a loving God protected his son and his family. And his protection allowed Jesus to survive Herod's massacre, as well as other trials, leading to Jesus' ultimate sacrifice of himself. I think J.K. Rowling uses the story of Lily's sacrifice to illustrate her belief that good will ultimately triumph in the face of evil, even in the chaos of events out of our control. Voldemort and Herod both represent evil to the authors, but the reasons they fail are decidedly different. One is an overtly religious story of a god that is bigger than any Herod-created evil designs. The other is a testament to how love may not have, have a fully formed plan, but it is a tool that will always repel evil in the end. So, we have reached the end of our inaugural episode of A Book Nerd and the Bible. I had a blast discussing Voldemort and Herod, and I think there were some parts of the discussion that I wasn't even expecting myself when I started this. These are two bad dudes for sure, but I think you get a completely different feel for them if you dig just below the surface. I want to thank you so much for listening, and I sincerely hope that this small podcast will help you to find new biblical illusions and meaning in our favorite stories like Harry Potter. I will be back next week to discuss part two of our Harry Potter discussion, three people and a not-so-fun party. I'll be looking at a comparison between the wise men and the nativity story and the three wizards who leave Harry at the Dursley's doorstep. In the meantime, I hope you'll check out our website on Anchor. You can find it at anchor.fm slash booknerd and the Bible. You can leave me a message on the site, as well as share our podcast with anyone who is a lover of books, biblical comparisons, or anywhere in between. Thanks again, and may the book nerd and you be blessed until we meet again.